she is famous for her pioneering work on wavelets, and there are many important applications. Uh, for example, uh, some of her results uh, became part of the JPEG 2000 standard. Uh, she has done a lot of uh, pioneering wor works in other fields, uh, too, uh, crossing boundaries between fundamental mathematics and applications. Uh, I think you will hear about some today. Um, uh, one focus of her recent uh, research is on the development of mathematical tools for comparing geometrical surfaces uh, and its application to evolutionary biology. Uh, she has received numerous awards and recognitions. Uh, to mention just a few, uh, she received the prestigious MacArthur Fellowship in 92. In 94, uh, she received the American Mathematical Society Steel Prize for exposition for her book, 10 Lectures on Wavelets. Uh, in 98, uh, she became a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, and in 2010, she was elected as the first woman president of the International Mathematical Union. Uh, she also received a prestigious award from our society, uh, the IEEE Information Theory Society Golden Jubilee Award for Technological Innovation. Uh, it's a great honor to have her here today. Um, and please join me in welcoming Professor Ingrid Dubushi. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, albeit a day late, and to see again so many old friends and, and, uh, and colleagues and, uh, uh, and the diaspora of Bell Labs. Uh, okay, so um, how I, this all started, this interest in uh, tools for art history. Um, it really started with Rick Johnson, who is at Cornell, he had a sabbatical in France. He always had been interested in art. He uh, uh, knew somebody in the Netherlands in computer science who was working with the conservation department at the Van Gogh Museum. He got to meet them, and uh, he saw that they used a lot of science. I mean, they, they actually they used chemical analysis, x-rays, uh, uh, infrared pictures, and so on. And he said, why are you not using image analysis? He says, well, why should we use image analysis? We have good microscopes, we have our eyes, and, and, and so on. He said, well, you might be surprised. I mean, there are things in image analysis that are happening and that could be useful to you. And they said, well, he says, well, will you let me organize a workshop? And so uh, he organized the IP for AI workshop, image processing for art investigation. And uh, well, the R is too much there. And uh, he, uh, he got image analysis teams interested in working on these data. The hook was that it's very hard usually to get museums to give you high resolution images of their artwork. They are very, very, very protective of this. It's gotten a little bit better since then. This, I'm talking 2007 here. Uh, but uh, uh, they, it's a little bit like their intellectual property. That's why in many uh, museums you're not allowed to take photographs with high-quality cameras on tripods and things like that. So um, since then, uh, so he got data from them. We had to sign our soul away in case we were uh, uh, these data ever leaked, and they have never done so. Uh, the Van Gogh Museum were also a little bit cautious. They didn't know us. They knew Rick by then, and they trusted him, but they didn't know us, the other ones. And so they gave us a black and white high resolution data, figuring, I think rightly so, that nobody would be interested if we were going to use these to print high quality books. And, uh, I mean, Van Gogh in black and white is just not quite the same. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the workshops, uh, uh, we have had uh, five workshops since then. We typically like to hold them, they're very small, they have maybe 30 people or so, uh, 40 people. They, we typically like to hold them at museums because we like art conservators, art historians to come. And it's the interplay between the two communities that I find especially interesting. And I want to uh, uh, illustrate that a little bit today. So uh, the very first one were focused tasks. So uh, we, uh, they gave us a task like distinguish. I mean, they were 
questions that they had about some paintings where they didn't quite know when in Van Gogh's life, in his career, he'd painted them, whether in Paris or already in Arles and so on. And so they wanted us to see whether we could, with our tools, do something. And some techniques even, even uh, in fact, did lead to a good classification of those. Or another thing they asked us was to characterize style. And so we did that. And I want to show you uh, uh, this. So, um, uh, so they gave us a, a, a whole uh, mass of paintings in very high resolution. You just have the thumb prints here. And they, some of those were Van Gogh. The ones with red dots in this mobile have, uh, uh, were at some point thought to be by Van Gogh, but in fact aren't. Uh, many of those are paintings that he had in his collection. When he, uh, uh, when he died. Some of them were paintings that he admired from earlier painters. Others were paint paintings that he had swapped with uh, friends. I mean, like they visited each other's studios. Oh, I like that one. Oh, can I have it instead of yours and so on? And so he had them in his collection. I mean, but they weren't by him. Uh, and there's one here, the one near the top. It's going to go behind there. It's the red dot. It's going behind it. will come back. Is in fact a forgery. It's a very, it's a, a, a infamous painting. Uh, is it coming back? Where is it? There, this one. This is a forgery that was made in the 30s. It's one of a series of the Waka forgeries, which are well known among uh, Van Gogh experts. Um, uh, and, and which at some point fooled experts and was thought to be by him. So they gave us all these paintings and they said, can you, by just studying the paintings, see which ones belong to each other or not? And so what we did is we cut them into pieces and we analyzed, we, we made, I mean, for, for images uh, it's, it, and the brush stroking, uh, an analysis in many different scales, a multi-resolution analysis with wavelets, really gives you a lot of information. It gives a much sparser representation. And so what we did is we made an analysis into wavelets. We then found uh, feature vectors that gave you an, um, a, a, a correlation between scales, so that were a little bit of like the brush stroke uh, uh, um, fingerprint, if you want for these different pieces. So we made feature vectors that had about 100 uh, different features in it for each piece. And then we just looked at L2 distances between feature vectors between the patches. And so we would make distances between patches of the same painting, distances between patches of different paintings, and so on. And we parlayed all that into a distance between similarity between paintings. And then once we had that, we could use uh, a multidimensional scaling in order to get the best possible 3D representation of that distance matrix. And that's what we then, we had to think of, of visualizing all this to the art historians because they were not going to be interested in all the technicalities. So we made a, a, a virtual mobile and we rotated it, and it actually worked very effectively in order to give them an impression of that distance. And they were very interested that things that were red, by and large, were near the edges of the cloud. On the other hand, there were also things that were true Van Gogh's that were close to the edges. So there is this one study, which is a plaster torso on a, a blue ground that's coming to the front here. It's far, fairly far out. I mean, well, but I mean, I wouldn't have recognized it as Van Gogh. I mean, so. Uh, so they, they, they like this. And um, we... We actually, at this workshop, the, uh, uh, the media uh, uh, got wind of it, and the television program Nova uh, had the idea of making a small program about this. And you can still catch it, and actually you don't even have to try to copy this whole uh, URL. If you just uh, uh, Google Art Authentication Nova, um, you, you'll find it. So uh, it's still on, on uh, you can still find it on the web. And uh, they thought they would give us something, I mean, instead of this scholarly thing, distinguished style, distinguished different periods, they thought they would make it more uh, uh, impactful, I mean, for the viewing public. They said, if we show you uh, paintings that, uh, high resolution pictures of paintings that you don't know yet, none of these 101, and one of them is not a Van Gogh, will you be able to recognize it? 
and will you be able, would you be willing to take up this challenge? And the different image analysis teams took up the challenge. And uh, so they were going to give us these data a week before the workshop. And then, uh, but we were game. I mean, we said, well, it will make publicity for the field. If we don't do well, then uh, that's also an interesting thing. And so, uh, so they got us these data and uh, uh, in black and white as well. And uh, we had to distinguish the, the right one. And then they made a little program about it. And I have, the, the full video is too long, but I have a little excerpt of it. Um, so uh, we are going to watch here and I'll talk to it, through it. Uh, so what happened is that they, uh, they uh, contacted, they first wanted to uh, contact somebody who had just finished a sentence for art forgery. In fact, this was somebody who was a, a talented copier and he sold paintings as copies of Van Gogh, but then uh, some dealer had uh, uh, sold one of those as a real one and uh, told him how much money it made and had kind of seduced him into. And so, of course, this, when this came to light, they both went to prison. But the, the, the painter actually got a lighter uh, uh, punish, uh, uh, sentence than, than the dealer, which I think was, was right. But he had just come out and the Nova wanted to contract him and the Van Gogh Museum said, no way. <laughs> I mean, if you even think of this, we stop. And so, but they had a different solution. They had, uh, they knew of Charlotte Caspers, who you here see from the back, who is a very talented artist in her own right, but who is an art historian also, who has specialized in uh, uh, what she calls reconstruction. So she reconstructs with the techniques of different periods, paintings, and, and so on. She does it mostly for educational purposes. Museums ask her to make pieces that are part of, of copies and where they document how it's made and, and so on. So they asked her to make a copy of this Van Gogh, and here you see her at work. And um, so uh, they actually they asked her to paint four different paintings. Uh, because they, they, they were going to film only one, one time, and, and uh, so, and, and they had to show her at work, I mean, so an early stage and so on, so she has all these different stages. I bought all the different copies except the finished coffee that went to Nova, and so I have them, I, my students and I own them. So we have here these different paintings, and you've seen in, in passing the different people uh, who are on different teams. There was a team from Maastricht, and a team from Penn State, and then us. And here you see Charlotte packing up the finished painting, leaving her front door. I mean, I learned a lot about television. This was the first time I was in, in the television program. Uh, uh, you have to do everything uh, naturally uh, four or five times. So, uh, uh, so actually, this particular scene that you see now, we only did once. I mean, we were standing here, and he was asking us to confirm which uh, number we had. This is when we first met Charlotte Caspers. And uh, she, uh, uh, the, the, they, she has to open up the box, and they ask us that to confirm just before she opens up the box which one of the paintings we chose of the six and uh, we say the numbers and yes we all agree and uh, uh, so uh, we, we, we are in unison and we actually didn't have a, a, uh, a doubt um, and Charlotte is going to open the box and indeed we find that it is the painting that we all identified and uh, Okay, and they love that. We had to do that a couple of times, this high five. I mean, uh, they, uh, they, it was naturally, of course. I mean, uh, um, so we, uh, so these were these, uh, the Nova Challenge, these, these different paintings, and we recognized this one painting as uh, having much more fine detail. In fact, what, what had we recognized? We, if you have a painting, this is a different painting, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about it later, but if I take a very, very, very small portion of it and enlarge it uh, enormously, and uh, we look here on the right, you see the, uh, wind, the wavelet uh, coefficients of, uh, at a very fine scale of that painting. Then uh, I, I hope you can see uh, that, that in fact there is a little bit of a wobble on, on the brush stroke. And of course when things are a little bit wobbly you need all those wavelet coefficients to put together that wobble. And we formed the theory that when you try to copy a painting you don't paint as fluidly 
as because uh, so so the painting of which we see this enlargement on the left is one of a data set where we uh, uh, we asked uh, Charles de Caspers, the, the, the same artist, to paint some little paintings naturally, and then to put aside the scene from which she painted, but just look at the, at the, at the, at the paintings and use her skills to copy that painting. And what we found is that, uh, and what we theorized, and then later we found, is that on these copies, you have, because you do your brush stroking in a much more deliberate way, much more controlled way, it's not as, as fluid. And so we found much, many more fine scale coefficients. And that's exactly how we had decided uh, which one of these, these Nova uh, 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 paintings here was. I mean, it was the one that had many more fine scale coefficients. And that's actually uh, one of the reasons I was very uh, thrilled to be in this IP4AI workshop was that I had, was looking forward to all the different techniques we were going to learn. But everybody, in fact, had used wavelet techniques. I mean, we used them in different ways. But everybody had actually zoomed in on that particular feature, and it was a very good feature. Okay, so... Um, in, for the next workshop, the Van Gogh Museum said, well, all that's very nice, uh, this uh, uh, showing us uh, uh, what you can do with wavelet coefficients and so on for television, but let's be a little bit more scholarly about this, please. And they had in their collection a, a painting that is a copy of a Van Gogh painting, which actually is an almost contemporaneous pop, uh, copy. It was made a very few years after his death. Um, and uh, they value it because it was made by somebody who could afford better paints than Van Gogh. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, a portrait of two little girls in a garden, and their dresses have a little bit of pink in them. And that you can see on the copy, but no longer on the original Van Gogh, because Van Gogh used a vermilion that was very bright but cheap, and that is known to fade. And so in the pink, it had faded. So you only see white dresses. And if you think, you don't associate pink to Van Gogh. Well, he probably didn't use it a lot. But when he used it, it's no longer there. So that's why we never think of pink and Van Gogh. But in this copy, he had used a higher, the copyist had used a much higher quality red, which persisted. So they like having this, this, this look back into time in what the colors were really like. But it's a copy. And they said, can you get this copy out from other paintings if we show it to you? We said, sure, we can. We've done it before. And so um, we get this, and we get another 32 paintings, and we analyze those, and we have a problem. Because, well, it was not 32, it was 21. All new 21 paintings look wobbly. I mean, have many more fine scale coefficients. I said, what's going on? Because some of those we knew were not copies, were authentic and very well documented. I mean, it was not that we all of a sudden uncovered a big scandal or so. We knew we were wrong. Um, and so we asked the other teams, I said, do you know, we, we, we do it again, we do it again. And we asked the other teams, we said, we're you having a problem. They say, we do. <laughs> and so we then looked into it and it turned out, I mean, so how did we get these high resolution pictures? Well, what museums do is they keep they make photographs of their paintings on, on, on fairly large scale. I mean, they make, they're immediately, as a special film, it's a positive film immediately, they're slides, and which are very fine grain, they're ectachromes, and uh, they like those a lot because they have very good color fidelity. And um, that is what is used whenever a, a, a book, a high resolution, uh, a very high quality reproduction is made, they're made from these photographs, not from the original painting. So, of course, we knew that they hadn't slammed down the paintings on a scanner to give us these, but we hadn't paid attention to the whole process. So, what happened is that the person giving us the, uh, uh, the, 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 the digital uh, uh, versions of the paintings had bought a new scanner. And he worked from the photographs, but the new scans were just more detailed. So, all of a sudden, we had, so that explained the difference, the much more fine scale. But it brought home to us that we really should have paid more attention to the whole acquisition process of the, the data. And we had been foolish not to. And so here you actually see that. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, a very small portion of one of the newly scanned things, a very small portion of an old one, and you immediately see there's a difference in sharpness. So we said, okay, well, we, we, we know about signals, we, let's do something about this. So uh, we realized then 
that we can actually, based on the scan itself, estimate how much blur there is in the scan. I mean, because we know that it's something made from uh, hair sharp uh, brush strokes. So we can estimate, and, and this is something that's now used in, in commercial cameras in order to sharpen up the, the snapshots you take. Uh, you, you estimate a, a blurriness on lines, on T-junctions, on corners, and between those different estimates, you can actually uh, guess what the most likely uh, a version is from which this blurred version was computed. And even if not everything was hair sharp, in our case, in fact, it probably was, and you can then reconstruct. And so you can, or reconstructions were done in these cameras, but we didn't even want to do that. We wanted to just estimate the blur. And it was very instructive. For instance, we got, uh, we had reproductions from uh, photographs of, uh, from two different museums, uh, which used two different photographers, and we could see that the Kroller Muller photographer, on average, was better than his colleague in Amsterdam. I mean, had a little sharper picture. The blur was, was I mean, so it was really interesting. But when we did this on the Van Gogh on the Nova 6, and we, we, we devised that on scale, where zero corresponds to no blur at all, and one to the blurriest thing in our data set, we saw that what we had picked up was that the Nova picture was sharper. Um, so here I am, eternalized on internet, giving high fives to a student for something that was, by scholarly standards, really a fake. I mean, it's painful. However, fortunately, we had, in, independently, and I was so, we were so lucky, we had, oops, I thought the first was a reaction to my thing, but I guess this is a phone. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, a phone that really knew when to whistle. Um, we, uh, we asked her to, and that's the paintings I showed you, we had asked her to do a validation test. So Charlotte was then still a student and I could entice her to come to the States by uh, offering her uh, three weeks stay in our house uh, with half her time off to visit all the museums in New York that she could, uh, that she could and wanted to visit. And uh, half the time uh, 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 she painted in a little studio we improvised in our basement. You see in the background the, 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 the drum set of my son. Uh, uh, she painted little originals and then copies of those. And here she is in the process of copying and you see how intently she looks in order to put every brush stroke down. And she made a whole lot of them and I still have a collection of them and we're going to uh, make a little exhibit of them explaining the whole story uh, in, in the newly created IID information initiative at Duke uh, uh, because we still have the ongoing uh, study there. Um, and you see here different scenes and the copies, and she documented very carefully how much time it took her to paint them. And in fact, an original, because these are very simple paintings, these are one layer paintings, uh, uh, took her 20 minutes. And uh, a copy would take her something like between 45 and 55 minutes. So yes, a copy takes longer for a simple painting like this. And uh, so that, that fit with our theory. And uh, so a difference of variety of materials and styles, some on very heavy canvas, some on very smooth board, some with uh, techniques that uh, er erase as much as possible the brush strokes with very fine and smooth and soft brushes, like the Flemish primitives, although the subject here on the top right is not quite what the Flemish primitives would paint, but, uh, and the bottom uh, uh, more coarse. And uh, so I have, I mean, the, the subjects of these were tchotchkes from a household, so I have this whole series of portraits of tchotchkes. And uh, she, what we found is that when we analyzed these, we did a more uh, sophisticated study with, with classification. We could, uh, we, we could found, in this case, we know which are the hesitating and the original copies. We have a grand truth set. We had uniform imagining conditions and painting conditions. They were painted by the same artist in the same lighting conditions. Uh, we could immediately uh, uh, scan them, since these were not precious things that had zillions of insurance premiums and so on. We could, so we had one stage eliminated. So the idea was to, to establish, is there a potential of doing it? I mean, how we don't do it on other things is something, but at least is it there? And uh, we did this for a variety of materials and styles in order to, uh, 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 to, to, to check for that. And what we found is that we indeed could distinguish between copies and originals if she used both hard and soft brushes. 
If she used very smooth ground and only very soft brushes, with the techniques we had done, we couldn't do it. In the meantime, we have this this, we, 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 this data set is openly available. If any of you would like to work on it, contact me and I'll point you to the, the way you can get it. Uh, uh, one of the, the, the things that I'm, I'm doing is that because I know it's so hard to get data sets on paintings, is to make everything of the validation data sets that we produce available to anybody. And um, we, uh, uh, so the thing is that where we are now is that yes, we can distinguish. Yes, we can, we have made progress even when she uses soft brushes, but we want to get to the point where we can say it in painterly terms, meaning uh, that the, uh, we can classify and I mean, again, we have technical papers about this and you can read them and all of you will be satisfied that indeed. But I can't say to the painter, except in this technical detail, what it is that I'm picking up. So to them, it's just as, 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 as uninformative as a connoisseur who says, well, I know how I can say it. I can see the difference if I see it, but I can't tell you how I do it. I mean, I can tell you how I do it, but I mean, to them, it doesn't mean anything. So we'd like to bring it back to painterly terms. And that's what we're working on now. And we have a, a brand new data set, which also will make avail is, is available to people who want it, in which Charlotte has uh, made uh, uh, paintings a whole lot. I mean, she came to visit uh, uh, a year and a half ago, and she made portraits of North Carolina birds. And uh, she again painted originals and copies of those. And they're very nice. They're much nicer paintings. They are painters, paintings that are real paintings, meaning they're in layers. There's a first layer that she would then let sit until it was dry enough to paint on more detail and so on, the way a real painting is made. And uh, we are studying those. Seven, several groups of us are, are looking at those with different tools in order to see whether we can uh, refine our tools and whether we can bring them back to painterly terms so that we could really explain to artists and art historians what we see. Okay, so there's that. But the interesting thing is that as we were working on these, I mean, so we have these IP4AI workshops, and I talk about this. And then people are there and they say, oh, wow, if you can do that, maybe you can help me with this. And so new problems came up and have been coming up all the time. And I want to tell you a little bit about a couple of them. I mean, I have many more. But, uh, and the first other one that came up was this uh, uh, woman's portrait that was hiding behind another Van Gogh. And uh, this had been known, I mean, this is a, a little patch of grass study that Van Gogh made in his Paris period. And if you turn it on its side and then look at the x-ray of it, you see that behind it, there is something else. Now, this is not something uh, exceptional. Van Gogh was poor and he reused a lot of canvas. About 30% of his paintings have another painting underneath. Uh, because, well, he, he wanted to try out things, he wanted to make studies and so on, and so if he felt he had learned from something, he would cover it up with, 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 with uh, 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 lead white again and then paint again over it. And it's only when you start looking at x-rays that you see these different layers. Now, but this particular painting was interesting to art historians because it showed that what was underneath was uh, a portrait of a woman, um, probably from that what they say is his Noonan period. Noonan is a very tiny village in uh, the Netherlands where his parents lived and where he started uh, uh, making a lot of portraits of peasants with very, very dark palettes. And there was recently an exhibit, a traveling exhibit, that talked about uh, uh, color, darkness and light and color. I mean, he tried to see how with a very dark palette and very restricted color range, he could give an impression of light in these portraits. And uh, he made many, many of them, and many of them are in the collections in Amsterdam and in the Kuller, uh, Muller Museum. But uh, there was one he also that he sent on to his brother Theo van Gogh in, in Paris. Uh, he, he kept up his whole life a very voluminous correspondence with his brother, with whom he was very close, and that whole correspondence is preserved. So the letter in which he sent the painting, with, that he sent with the painting is preserved. And it's, it, there's a letter that says, uh, Theo, I've been doing this experiment with dark palette and so on, and I'm sending you one painting in which I really feel that I kept, I, 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 I succeeded in what I want to do. So, I mean, given that he said that himself, people are interested in it. 
That painting, however, was never found. And so the surmise was that uh, it was something that once he got to Paris and changed his style, he himself appreciated less. And since he always needed new canvas, that he then covered and painted something else on. So this might be that one in which he had described earlier that he'd done so well. So people were interested in knowing more about it. And so um, uh, uh, Kuhn Janssen and, and, and uh, Joris Dick are, uh, uh, Kuhn Janssen is a, a, a chemist in Antwerp who is uh, 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 specialized in material science. Joris Dick has uh, two degrees in art history and in material science. And so uh, they realized that with X-ray fluorescence, they could uh, get an idea of uh, the, the pigments at, at, uh, at each spot. And so they got the permission, because this is uh, it's a Van Gogh, so it's not, it's not cheap, but it's not one of his big masterworks. They got permission to transport it once to a machine that had the right X-ray range and where they could do measurements on X-ray fluorescence. This was in a hospital in Amsterdam. I mean, this must have been months of negotiations with insurance companies, but in any case, they managed to do it. And it was put on a little a sled in front of a, a, a high uh, uh, energy X-ray beam, which was moved then, I mean, every the voxel, pixel by pixel was analyzed and spectra were taken. And so after one pixel was done, the next one was done and so on. And so they took all these measurements. Um, now, this X-ray machine existed there because it existed to make uh, 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 short-lived radioactive components that were used for medical tests. That's why they had an hospital. And so this beam was not always in use. I mean, it was in use sometimes, and when it was in use for the medical purposes, the whole thing stopped. But then when the beam was free, it would be diverted to them, and then the thing could, could measure. And so they did this, and uh, they, based on that, they... Uh, so here you have two of the images, they did it. So they have now spectral lines of X-ray fluorescence with which they can analyze different elements. They can identify different elements at different spots. And here are the, the, the things for two different elements, arsine and antimony. And antimony is uh, an ingredient of Naples yellow, which was the only very light colored pigment that Van Gogh had on his palette then. Uh, arsine is uh, a part of the vermilion that he was using. So, and you do see indeed that you get already a much better impression of this portrait underneath. And uh, they, based on this, they did some little colorization with uh, Photoshop and they came up with this portrait, which people really felt gave them already a much better impression than, uh, but they, they, uh, they told us that, so when I'd given this IP4AI2 uh, uh, presentation, they asked us, maybe you guys can do better. And so we looked at the data set, and uh, we, we got, it took a while before we really got the data raw, but I don't know what you can see, but there's some kind of zigzag here when you look at these black spots. The black spots are because on the overpainting, Van Gogh started using his big impasto, and so sometimes you have this big blob of paint on the top painting, which the x-rays didn't penetrate, so all of a sudden you have a black spot. Why is there a zigzag? Well, because they had a problem apparently with the synchrony of the moving of the sled and when the beam was available. And so since it was scanned in, 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 in zigzag, you have sometimes a black spot that is now rendered not exactly at the right spot and you have this zigzag pattern. Now, you see it very clearly there and in order to make their colorization, they had uh, tried to correct that kind of manually in the, big, in the bad spaces, but it really happens all over the place and also for smaller uh, things. So what we, the first thing we did is on the data set, we uh, did a variational algorithm where we went over line by line and found readjustments for pieces of lines that gave the best uh, uh, bringing together of big blobs. And I mean, so that was, uh, it's a nice thing you can do it. We, we had to work a little bit to make something that was a nice and stable converging algorithm, but it worked. It was already a nice challenge, that. But then the next thing we did is we took the blobs and we painted them in. I mean, and that is something that uh, uh, can be done. Um, here, I mean, this is a very, very small area on, 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 on her face. You see where we have the blobs. We put masks around that. We did it kind of automatically. I mean, and, you, and then you see with the painting, I mean, when, when you do in-painting on an image, 
what you try to do is take information from elsewhere and complete where you don't know the information. But with a painting, you're in much better conditions than with other things, because the painting, after all, is something made by a person who is brushstroking. And you have information about brushstroking all over the painting, even if it's in different places. I mean, if it's something that is kind of painterly similar, the same kind of brushstroking is going to be used. So you can really in-paint brushstroking very well. In, 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 uh, and so here, you, it will go fairly fast, but uh, you see how we in paint, I mean, and you do exactly what, a, uh, what an, a, an art conservator does when they try to in paint. I mean, that's exactly what they do. They look at losses and they say, I know here, I know here, and how do they paint? Okay, so this is probably what was here. And then they make it a little smaller, 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 until the hole gets closed up. And so that's what we did. And, um, so we did that in painting, and then uh, we finally we wanted to also do the coloring better. Now we didn't have, it turned out that we didn't have enough information to do the RGB. Uh, we really had only two of the components. And so we couldn't, from the information given to us, to get a, a better RGB, because we're missing all the earth colors. I mean, the, 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 the range of, of X-ray fluorescence gave us some of the elements, but none of the of people of you who paint, none of the lake colors and so on, the earth colors. So we were missing information that we couldn't reconstruct. So what we did is we actually looked at all the Noonan paintings that Van Gogh made, and we analyzed them. Some of them have very high contrast, some of them have very little contrast. And we, uh, we, we decomposed them into luminance and saturation and chromance. And it turned out, I mean, surely something Van Gogh was not aware of, that in that period, if you just look at the color distribution, that was actually, I mean, so saturation changed when he had contrast. Uh, and he had some very low and some very high contrast. But the, the, the color distribution was fairly constant among all those paintings. So what we could do is then interpolate from these other paintings, given the information we had, and reconstruct. And so the result of all that, in the end, was this. And uh, they, I mean, uh, they, they were absolutely delighted. I mean, because she really came to life. I mean, it's still not enough to see why Van Gogh thought this, this was the best one of the whole series, but at least we actually have, in the meantime, identified the model because while Noonan was a small village, he made hundreds of paintings, so he actually made other paintings of this same woman. And so it's a project for one of the undergrad students who's starting to become interested in this to actually compare the two. When we get high resolution uh, data on the other paintings, which is not trivial, as I said, to get. But uh, Anyway, so I want to tell you then about collaborations that are going right, um, right now between... Oops. Oh, what's happening? Oh my, has this been going on for long? Oh, there it is. Oof. Okay, sorry. No prejudice against Duke here. Uh, okay, between NCMA, the North Carolina Museum of Art, and, and Duke. And we have been very, very happy because uh, it's a small museum, but actually has some beautiful things. And uh, we, uh, but they are very, very open. I mean, they've had good experiences in working with scientists, and they, they let us use their data. I mean, we have none of this nonsense that we have to go through with, 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 with most other museums. Uh, so, when I joined the faculty at Duke, very soon after, I uh, presented some of my earlier work, I mean, the Van Gogh work, and uh, Bill Brown, who is the head conservator, uh, suggested a new, uh, a new project. He, uh, they have a beautiful altarpiece by Giotto in, uh, 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 in, in uh, uh, North Carolina Museum of Art, and it has, uh, uh, it's, it's the first one that shows uh, portraits of other people than, uh, uh, I mean, 
Christ and, and the Virgin were known from icons from, uh, I mean, as the, 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 the painters in Italy uh, started taking over Byzantine traditions and started showing uh, these, these paintings with a little bit more realism than in, in usually you have in, in the icons. But here they were also showing other saints. And, 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 and so it, it, was, it was a new departure for painting in Italy. So, and it's, it's an actually a gorgeous painting. But they feel, and it's not something that, that is un, unusual for that time, they feel that the art historians, that they can uh, see different hands, different people at work in this altarpiece. And this is something customary that uh, uh, a master would have apprentices and the very talented apprentices were allowed to work on big commissions if they already did very good work. And so they wanted us to see whether we could in that identify with our techniques different uh, uh, hands. And so what we did is we, uh, we again, uh, um, we did a, a more sophisticated machine learning analysis here. We then identified features and so on, but then we identified which features usually came together. And we, we did actually like, like uh, uh, it was a topic analysis. We identified the equivalent for a text of words, and then we saw which words came together in topics. And so I identified in, in that terminology about 20 topics here. And in that, we always have the problem of how do we visualize what we do. So one thing we thought of here is, is for one topic is we uh, uh, show the, uh, uh, the different patches in which a topic is very pronounced with an intensity proportional to how pronounced it is there. And uh, then you see that it's much more pronounced in some paintings than others. And, and, uh, and so based on that, we did uh, classification. And here you already have an idea that indeed you, you start seeing clustering of the different paintings. Uh, and here you have the different distributions. And we felt that based on this, there were two paintings that stand out especially as being different from the others. And uh, when you go back to the paintings, oops, uh, when you go back to the paintings, let me go back here, it is the painting two, the Virgin, and painting five, which is St. Francis, which in fact, art historians feel are paintings that are different from the others. St. Francis in particular, they feel is the best of the five paintings. I mean, it, it has more modeling in it, more natural, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, so a similar difference had been uh, brought to light by a completely independent study, completely different techniques, not image analysis techniques, done by the, uh, uh, um, done by, by art historians who were studying the painting prior to, to uh, cleaning. So they were, it's a preliminary study because we want to go back to it, we want to distinguish uh, different areas, hands and faces and so on within the paintings and, and do a more detailed study, but uh, it's very promising. But based on that, again, what happened is that uh, it led to, this first result led to others that are even more interesting, I think. So the, uh, Bill, Bill Brown told us about uh, an altarpiece that uh, uh, NCMA, that he's very much invested in, which is much less famous, uh, um, and which is uh, by a painter coming from, uh, called Gissi, of which the North Carolina Museum has three little panels. And there are three more of that same altarpiece that exists in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. There's one that is in Portland. The centerpiece is in uh, uh, Chicago, it's the Museum of Fine Arts in Chicago. And the last one actually is missing and has been, there's no traces in the literature describing this altarpiece of that last panel. It must have existed, but they don't have it. And uh, the uh, North, uh, the NCMA is going to have an exhibit in the fall of 2016 where they bring together these different panels for the first time in almost a century. In, uh, and there's a lot of interesting challenges as we were discussing this. Well, first of all, there's the missing panel. They thought they would just have an extensive hunt among all paintings known of, of the 14th century in, in, uh, uh, 
in art catalogs and try to find it and nothing has shown. And so we came up with the idea that Charlotte could paint a reconstruction. And in fact, you see her here she, uh, at doing what, what, what her job is. Here she's painting a copy of uh, Van Mierenveld in, in, in Rotterdam. Here she's actually painting, this was a reconstruction for uh, Ghent. For those of you who've seen Monuments Man, this is uh, one of the panels of that very, very, very famous painting that is in Ghent. It's the altarpiece by the Van Eyck brothers. Br brothers. It's called in Dutch Het Lam Gods. And uh, uh, she's painting a, a, uh, a small copy of it where she is documenting all the different layers. Uh, here, actually, you see a little study she made for a museum in Rotterdam, Van uh, Boymans van Beuningen, where um, the whole panel shows all the different preparation layers. Now, you start seeing things on the panel only halfway. I mean, you see that every layer stops five millimeters short of the previous one. Doesn't mean there are no layers here. It means that there are a zillion preparation layers. I mean, several layers of glue, several layers of this plaster, several and so on. We have manuals from that time of how people painted. So we know very well all the stages and she has resurrected some of these techniques. And uh, so the underdrawing, the different layers of paint because the painting looks, I mean, uh, flesh tones in that style were actually painted with some green undercolor. And it's only with the glazing over it that they became flesh tones. I mean, you really have to know these things. Otherwise, I mean, how would you ever come up with that? Anyway, so she first made a study with the uh, uh, art historians about what should have been there. And you can say, how can they guess a non-existent painting? Well, these things were really like cartoons of their time. They were, these, these altarpieces were educational for a public that was largely illiterate, and they followed a standard. This is the life of uh, John uh, uh, the Evangelist, and it's showing stages of his life, and uh, it's showing him actually, if you really look in detail, it's showing him aging slowly through different panels, and they had a very good guess of what the final panel would be, it would be the baptism of a, 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 a person who was very much opposed to Christianity before, all the miracles that are shown on the previous panels. And so she made a drawing on that, very much basing herself on the pictorial uh, way of representing the figure. And you see uh, John the Evangelist is always represented in his standard colors with blue and, 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 and red and, and, and so on. And so she made that uh, uh, composition that fit with the others and then she went through all the stages of, of preparing it here you see her gilding on a layer of bolus and then polishing the gilding with an agate that's actually uh, very similar to the agate on her in her ring uh, because you can make these things very shiny and then uh, punches were made because these these gold things were punched and she's punching here uh, and the, the painting is exquisite. I mean, it's really beautiful. And here, I mean, you see it next to the others. Uh, the new panel is really bright and shiny. And uh, here you see it next to the other three panels in the museum. I mean, it's, it's so bright, so shiny. The, the art conservators and the art historians there were so happy with seeing one of these paintings as it was when it was new. I mean, all the colors were completely uh, uh, analyzed with, with X-ray fluorescence and so on. So she knew what colors to use, what pigments, the pigments were prepared in a traditional way, and so on. So they have a real impression of what it was. But then they have a problem. Because although at the exhibition in the fall of 2016, it will give people a very lively impression of what the painting looks like, they will have eyes only for this new bright thing. It's the only one that's not authentic. I mean, so that's a challenge. And I said, and so we're using it as a challenge. What we're doing, we, we're, we're going to analyze the older paintings, analyze what makes them look old, the change of color, the cracks. And with that, we can make a virtual aged new panel. We could also physically age it, but they don't want to do that because 50 years down the line, it may become a fake. I mean, sold as a, a fake. I mean, as a, a true thing when it isn't. And so uh, you never know. And uh, so, but we can also, and that I find even more interesting, we can use this to rejuvenate the old panels. 
So we're planning to have an exhibit where we have the old panels rejuvenated and the new panel and so on, and they will be shown. And we can also, we are going to also make a movie of people walking into it and seeing this. Now, can we do that? Yes, actually, we have experience in doing this. In the altarpiece by uh, uh, Van Eyck here, when you close it, there is this annunciation panel on the left, on, on the right, sorry. And when you blow that up a lot, you see this book and it shows all these cracks. And, um, well, maybe it's better if I use my, my uh, here. If you look here, I mean, this, it's hard to distinguish what this is. Is this a W? Is this a U and something else following it? I mean, this text was written in this medieval handwriting with all horizontal and vertical lines. I mean, even a pristine text I cannot read. I mean, it's just gibberish to me. But people who can read this, this kind of writing can, can read this. But they cannot read this painting because of the, it makes it hard. And people said, well, of course you can't read it because he didn't really paint the text. I mean, he just painted horizontal and vertical lines to look like a text. But Van Eyck was an extreme, extreme ex perfectionist. So it's kind of hard to believe he would do that. And so we analyzed this and we, did, we analyzed the crack map. I mean, it's not easy. Because you might say, well, it's easy in Photoshop, you find the brown of that, but well, there's brown all over. Plus, every crack is not just one shade of brown, there's many. Plus, a crack is something that physically corresponds to the, 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 the edges of the, the crack raising a little bit. And so, uh, when you clean it, it means that you abrade a little bit more on the edges, so it has lighter things next to it. So, it was actually, it's, it's highly non-trivial, and it, it used machine learning techniques to find a good crack map. And then we uh, uh, painted in the cracks using a, a, a specially adapted. And so that gave rise to the text you see on the right. And you now see that this, in fact, is an A. It was not easy to see that before. Once you know it, you can see it. But before. So the result is that now many more words can be read in this text. And so the text has been identified. And it turns out it's a text of Thomas of Aquinas on the Annunciation. So, well, Van Gogh was the perfectionist we thought he was. So, yes, we can do that. But we want to do this crack removal on the Gysi. So we look at the x-rays. I say, what are these things? And they say, oh, that's the cradle. I said, the cradle. Well, these wooden paintings, paintings on panels, in the 19th and 20th century, they were cradled. That means they removed all the wood layers, made it very thin, and then put a frame to give it uh, rigidity again. They did that because there was worm damage, as you can see here. Now, the result is they did this all before they learned that x-rays were so useful. And so, in, in, uh, when you look at the x-rays, you see mostly the cradling. And so it's really a nuisance. So they have in all these conservation departments people who make a, uh, ha whose job it is, when, when they really can't postpone it because they hate it, to use Photoshop to remove all these artifacts before they can publish one of these. That's why you've never seen a painting, an x-ray like that in a, in a book, because they remove it painstakingly, hours and hours of work, because nothing is truly horizontal. Nothing is truly vertical. I mean, you have to do it almost pixel by pixel. So I said, we should be able to do that. And it's not trivial because of all these things. And uh, they also, once they said, oh, can you do something virtual? They started becoming greedy. I mean, because it's not only, they're not interested only in the cracks and so on. They're also interested in the wood grain. I said, because the, the cradling has wood grain. Can you remove that wood grain but retain the other wood grain? And yes, we can. You have, again, it's a sophisticated machine learning thing. You have places where you have painting plus panel. You have other places where you have painting plus panel plus cradling. You have to learn with dictionaries, with an Bayesian approach, these different things, and then you can disentangle them. And this is the result. Uh, this is a student of mine who's called Rachel Yin, who is uh, wonderful. I mean, in a few years when she's on the market, you should look out for her. Um, on the left, you see what our algorithm does. On the right, you see, uh, for comparison, the result of a professional art conservator using Photoshop. 
And this will, uh, so Rachel will present this at ICIP in October or, or November, I forget when ICIP is. And, uh, and I've, I've, I've gone over time, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingrid, for a great talk. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Hi, Ingrid. Hi, Sergeant. Uh, two two uh, comments. Uh, first of all, uh, in painting, um, there has been some work in this community. Absolutely. Um, which is actually interesting because it's very connected to universal data compression. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the main challenge is to model a context. And that's yes. exactly what we do in universal data compression, except that here you have to do it on a two-dimensional basis rather yes. than one-dimensional, non-causal. So Sahi Weisman and his friends okay. uh, have papers on this. And the second comment is um, Johannes Vermeer. Yes. So um, this goes two centuries back in time from Van Gogh, and he painted only 34 paintings. But he, uh, his paintings are some of the most realistic paintings mm -hmm. ever made. So it's always been a challenge to understand what technique he used. To, to do that. And now there are several theories. Yes. David Hockney has a theory. Yes. Tim Janis, there was a movie, Tim, Vers Tim Vermeer, about yes. it. So I wonder if uh, image processing could shed some light into maybe finding what was the de deconvolution process that he uh -huh. used in order to, uh, to make those paintings. Uh, so um, the first, uh, first comment you made, uh, uh, I, I, I I know that there's 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 work on on on, on in painting and and and, uh, and data modeling and universal compression and and that is very interesting and and we haven't looked into that but uh, yeah absolutely and in fact uh, we we that's exactly what we do is we make a good model of of I mean for the text of an egg text that's exactly what they had to do they made a, 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 they had to make a sophisticated model of that environment, the text environment, because many of the cracks were in the same direction as the letters and so on, it was really challenging and uh, in order to bring that to a good end. Um, the, uh, the second one, uh, Vermeer, of course, I mean, is, there's, there's actually even, even more going on. I mean, there's uh, uh, many people who uh, uh, look at Vermeer paintings feel that among the paintings that are authenticated as Vermeer, there are some that are different, that are extremely realistic as well, but different in style from some of the others. And uh, there's a theory that maybe uh, uh, he, his daughter was his apprentice. And I mean, so I know nothing and I'm not going to pronounce anything. I mean, because this is, we, we try to very much put our work as something in collaboration with art historians and art conservators, but we don't want to start replacing or make judgments. We want them to give them additional tools on which to base them, because I think that's the best way to build the collaboration rather than get into all kinds of trouble. I mean, uh, um, the, 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 how Vermeer managed to do what he did is, I, yeah, I don't know. I think it would be very interesting to do uh, some some detailed image analysis there. Uh, we we uh, we haven't. I don't have any data sets except for X-rays of Vermeer paintings, but uh, of the visual data sets, I, I have no access to high resolution right now. Uh, one of the people who makes this theory about the daughter of Vermeer and so on wanted to get our input and I said, well, give us data. And he gave us what he thought were high resolution data. I said, we can do nothing with this. I mean, there's way, very little. I mean, high resolution means much more than a sharp picture. And um, we, uh, we do have a, a, a project that is a little bit not quite like that, but on Van Eyck, where we have the high-resolution data. There's one of the panels of the uh, adoration of the lamp that was stolen a long time ago. We only have high-quality black and white pictures of before, of the original. Uh, the, and based on those pictures, a copy was painted in the, the, the 30s. 
uh, by Van der Vicken, and that's the one that's exposed. And it's, it's, it's told to people that this. When you look at it, when you stand in front of the painting, you feel that it's, it's not as good. It's, it's flatter. It's not that. So what we would like to do, and I think it would be a great project again for students, is to learn how Van Eyck managed, how, how his depth of flesh tones and so on worked. And then based on the Van der Weken, which is a very, very good painting, but Van Eyckify it virtually. I mean, which I think would be, uh, could be a lot of fun. And I mean, maybe not of, of, of great value art historically, but I mean, it could be fun, it could be challenging. And uh, I'm sure it would attract uh, a lot of press in Ghent, which they can always use because that means more funding for many other projects. We have sessions coming up, so uh, we have to stop now. Uh, let's thank Professor Kubashi again.